Amen. Thank God for His Word this morning. This is a great passage, a great portion of Scripture that we can approach. Before we dive into it, I have a question for you. Has anyone here ever interviewed anybody for a job? Got a few people, and I'm sure many of you have been interviewed for jobs if you haven't interviewed someone else. So you just sat on the other side of the table. Now, there's probably endless stories of disaster interviews. Um, my mom actually works for Manpower, a company that um, helps people find employment. Um, in her role, it's mostly um, kind of manufacturing jobs, working at, at different factories and things, and she's got a lot of stories. But one of them that takes the cake uh, to me, that I'll share with you, is of a, a friend of a friend uh, who was desperate for a job and yet had not planned very well in preparation for his interview. And so as a result of his lack of planning, uh, he ended up being very late for the interview. Um, and he knew he was going to be late, so he was like running around preparing, ended up getting very sweaty. I think it was like a hot summer day, and his car also didn't have good air conditioning, and so he was in his clothes, sweaty, jumps in his car, drives as fast as he can to the location, to the office. And I think it was supposed to be like an office job. So he was fully dressed, sweat dripping down his head and his face, and he runs in. He's already late. Everybody's been waiting for him. The panel is sitting there in the room. He walks in. He sits down, half out of breath, and they start asking him questions. And he's completely bombing the interview, like horrible answers, doesn't, doesn't have a chance of getting the job, and he probably realizes this. And, and, and rather than humoring him partway through, one of the women on the interview panel just says, all right, this, is, this has gone on long enough. This interview, you're not getting this job, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple tips on how to get an interview how to prepare for an interview in the future so that you don't do this again. And just literally proceeded to just lecture him about how unqualified, unprepared, and basically how poor he was doing at candidating for this role. And if you know the guy, uh, it's, it's even funnier. Um, but anyway, with all of that said, we've all, we're probably all aware of people having disaster interviews. Maybe you've experienced one yourself. Now, I want you to think of another interview. Imagine you're the apostles. You've got Peter and John and, I don't know, maybe like Philip and Andrew. They're the interview panel. And they're trying to find another apostle. We need people to add to the team to go and take Jesus' mission into the world. And Paul kind of wanders into the room, sits down. And he says, okay, uh, we see we've got your, your resume here. You're applying for the job of Apostle of Jesus? Okay, what are your qualifications? I see you're a Pharisee. You've got some training in the Bible, but you're also part of the team that hates us and is trying to stop us. And Paul says, yeah, well, I mean, I guess for qualifications, you could say I'm a blasphemer. I'm a persecutor. I'm a pretty violent, angry, nasty guy. And they're like, oh, well, these are, these are not great qualifications. You can notice the disciples are probably all like looking at the resumes, looking at each other, like at what point are they going to just kind of shut the thing down and get him out? And then they look at him, do you even want this job? No, I don't, I don't believe in what you're doing at all. In fact, I'm, I'm quite opposed to it. And right when the, the apostles are literally on the verge of kind of shutting the interview down, telling Paul, these are all the reasons you're not qualified, unqualified, just please get out of here. We're actually kind of afraid of you. You're pretty intimidating, and you might actually get us killed. Right when they're about ready to do that, Jesus just like walks into the interview room, and he says, hire. I'm going to forgive you. I'll make you mine. You're on my team. You've got a job. 
And that's what Paul is telling us here in this passage. This is what the grace of Jesus is. Paul has a disaster interview, and Jesus declares him faithful and welcomes him. That's grace. So I think the main point of the Apostle Paul's little message here, if you notice, he he does this funny little thing where he's in the middle talking to Timothy, and he's telling him, watch out, there are people in the church, we know this, that are teaching the law, they're teaching it wrong, they're getting off track. They're talking about genealogies and throwing in myths, and they're trying to teach the law, but they're teaching it wrongly, and they're teaching it as if maybe obeying it is what you need to do in order to be good enough for Jesus. This kind of teaching is not what Jesus wanted any of us to do. It's not what this is about. And in the middle of that, he stops. He's mentioned that he's been entrusted with the gospel, and then here, out of kind of almost out of nowhere, he just decides, I've got to tell my story. And so he goes, and he can't think of a better way to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ than to introduce himself. He says in verse 7 there, he says, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And so in this, this little section, this little testimony that Paul gives us, he shows us that the gospel of the grace of Christ Jesus produces salvation, praise, and service. The gospel of the grace of Christ Jesus produces salvation, it produces praise, and it produces service of Jesus. And as I normally do, I'm going to try to break this up a little bit. It's, I'm going to overlap, I, I promise. This time around, I had trouble breaking the passage up because it kind of all blurs a, a little bit, at least in my mind. But if you look at the first, first three verses, 12 to 14, we see him talking about this grace of Jesus. And then if we look at 15 and 16, we see Jesus' salvation. And then 17, we just see praise. And I'll tack on the service that Paul gives Jesus. So, Jesus' grace, Jesus' salvation, and then praise and service. If you remember at the beginning of this, Paul uh, had said, I sent you to Ephesus so that you would charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And then, importantly, he says here in verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What the apostles are trying to do, what Timothy's job is to do, what the elders at the church are supposed to be doing, what the churches of Jesus Christ are supposed to be doing is shooting for love. Our goal is love, and that love is supposed to come out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And so Paul wants us to see here now that there's there's a group of people and there's a, a group of things happening that are steering the church, swerving the church off course, and he wants to show us his life, and as an example of what love looks like that comes as a result of a sincere heart, of sincere faith, of a, of a changed life. And so we see in verses 12 through 14, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul starts out by saying, I just have to give thanks to Jesus for the gospel. I have to give thanks to Christ Jesus. I'm full of thanks. Like my heart is overflowing with thanksgiving for Christ Jesus. That proper teaching of the gospel results in hearts that are actually overflowing with thanksgiving, and that's what Paul has. And then notice, he he gives us his his qualifications, like what made him a proper recipient of the love of Jesus, of the grace of Jesus. 
And if you notice, they're not good qualifications. He didn't have a list of good things that he had done prior to this that made Jesus look at him and say, that guy's faithful, I'll give him grace. That's not how grace works at all. In fact, what Paul says here is he says, I was a blasphemer, meaning I didn't believe in Jesus, I hated Jesus, I spoke against Jesus, and then I went around trying to force all of Jesus' followers to speak against him the same. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God who has come into the world to save sinners, and I hated him, and I wanted everyone to hate him, and I wanted to speak against him. That's my first qualification here for why he would save me. Next, he says, I was a persecutor. And we know this, right? We know Paul's story. We know that he hunted Christians down. I mentioned this in my last sermon at the very beginning as I tried to introduce this man. But he had denied Jesus himself, And then in in Acts chapter 8, I'll just read a couple quick little summaries of what it says he did. Not only was he there when Stephen, the first martyr, was killed, and he kind of like was almost orchestrating it. It was a mob violence activity. This wasn't like a sanctioned execution from the government. It was a bunch of angry people, and he was like, "Eh, everybody give me your coats, and yeah, go kill him. That was his approach. It wasn't even even just what he had done with with Stephen. And then right after that, we're told, and Paul or, and Saul was ravaging the church and he was entering house after house and he would drag off men and women and commit them to prison. And then just a chapter later, we see Paul, this angry man, says, and, Paul, and Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He was murderous. Hunting them down, killing them, trying to force them to blaspheme. And then we're also told, if you see there, he says he was an insolent opponent. That's kind of a weird word. We don't really use the word insolent. And even if you look up the word insolent in an in English dictionary, it wouldn't quite capture what, what Paul's saying here. Not only was he like an angry, nasty guy that would like get in a fight with Jesus if he could, but he was a violent man who wanted to humiliate his enemies. He was dragging these poor, innocent people, going into their homes, ripping them out, throwing them in prison, trying to get them killed. Just the nastiest person you can imagine. And then notice, he also says, a little bit later, he says, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Ignorantly in unbelief. He was ignorant and he didn't believe. Now, you might read that and think, that's kind of a weird thing. Like, it almost seems like he's justifying why he did this or why Jesus would have shown him mercy. And in a sense, I think he is. Um, Notice, like, just like, Nowadays, in God's law, ignorance of the law does not excuse violating the law. There are still consequences regardless of ignorance. But I think what Paul is trying to qualify here a little bit is that he was, he was ignorant, he didn't believe, and because of that, he wasn't committing the unforgivable sin, if you will. Jesus says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin, which means that if you knowingly oppose God and his work, if you see what God is doing in the world, you have a real conviction about it and you still deny it and suppress it and oppose it, well, I think that's what the Bible refers to as the unforgivable sin. And Saul, Saul or Paul is saying, I, I wasn't quite there. I was still ignorant. I thought I was doing the right thing, although I was doing it completely wrong. I thought I was opposing a real problem, a real enemy of God by going after these Christians. But again, ignorance of the law is not an excuse for sin. Ignorance of opposition to Jesus is not an excuse to oppose Jesus. And it wasn't that Paul had anything in himself that made him a proper recipient of Jesus' grace. He was ignorant. He didn't believe. And I think this is important too because the apostle Paul says this of himself, but he he also says this of the Jews of his day. Like, he wanted to see the Jewish people turn to Jesus. He wanted to see them saved. Jesus often called the religious leaders, the Pharisees that were in opposition to him, to repentance at their time. And Paul says later on in Romans chapter 10, while he's, he's in the middle of his ministry, he says, talking about the Jews, I bear witness to them that they have a zeal for God, but it's not in accordance with knowledge. In fact, they have a, they're zealous for God, just like, just like Paul, formerly Saul, was. And yet it's, it's a zeal that's an ignorant zeal. They don't, they don't know that Jesus really is God incarnate, really is the Messiah who came to save. 
And Jesus himself told his disciples, well, beware, this is going to happen to you. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Again, ignorance is what drives often opponents of the gospel. And if there is even violent opposition to the gospel from people who are opposed to it, to us, and to our message, it can be done out of ignorance. It doesn't excuse the acts. In fact, you can be dead wrong and yet not be committing the unforgivable sin. And if you think about it, I mean, in our day, this is almost equivalent to like a jihadi suicide bomber who thinks, I will strap myself up with explosives and go in and kill a whole bunch of innocent people. Some of the, one of the most heinous, horrible things you could think. But in their mind, they have, they've believed, they're ignorant. They have believed that this act of, of horrible, murderous violence Will, will gain them some form of salvation. They will end up in paradise, surrounded by virgin wives, living forever, rewarded for their sacrifice. And I think this is kind of what Paul was saying. I, I was ignorant. I didn't believe. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know God. I thought I did. And yet, I was incredibly guilty. And he, was, he was so unlikely of a candidate that when God saved him, when Jesus came down and knocked him off his horse, blinded him, told him, you are persecuting me, Jesus. I am the Messiah. Essentially, I am God. Stop it. When Paul is told to go in and find this guy named Ananias, can you imagine, like, Ananias is, is there. God tells him, hey, there's, there's this guy named Saul. He's coming to you. I want you to, like, take him in and pray for him. Ananias says, are you sure, God? <laughs> Saul? We've, all, we've heard about this guy. It's not Saul. It can't be him. He can't be the one you're showing your grace to. And yet God says to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And, and Saul was going to suffer a lot for Jesus, but, but God saved him. That's, that's, this is what grace is. You can be the enemy of God's people. You can be the worst of sinners. And he will save you. He, he can save you. That is grace. And notice what he says then in verse 14. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He's saying this grace, the goodness of God, the undeserved blessing, the undeserved forgiveness and benefit that God gave to me, it came and it was like a flood. God, Paul actually makes up a word here. He says it was like super abundant. It was greater than a flood. It overflowed. It just nailed me. And it changed me. And it, and it created in me faith. This is, this is what grace does too. The Bible makes it pretty clear that faith itself is a gift. We don't work that one up. It's not like we, we read enough, we get enough ideas, and then suddenly we say, if I can just get more faith, like I'll, I'll believe real hard, and then Jesus will save me. Paul says, Jesus hit me with his grace, and then all of a sudden I had faith. Like I was flooded with grace, and then out of that, out of that overflowing banks of a flooding river, then the fruits of faith and love came up. I was a different person after he hit me with his grace. And notice it's the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It's the grace from the Lord that results in faith and love after Paul is in Christ Jesus. Love is not a precursor of salvation. Faith is not a precursor of salvation. Grace comes it saves you, and then it makes you a different person as you, as you grow up into Christ. And this is the other thing that's amazing. This is why Paul, I think, is telling us that his testimony here. He's saying, I could have, like, it would have been good enough. It would have been way above what I deserved if God just saved me. He could have said, 
Saul, you've caused a lot of problems for me. I'm going to forgive you, and then I want to put you in a corner for a while. In fact, I'll just put you in a corner for a while. Just don't cause any more problems, okay? Like, that would have been great. But we're told that he actually strengthened him for service and then determined and called him faithful and put him into ministry, into service, after everything he had done. He could have been sitting there with his nose in the corner for the rest of his life and been happy, but he, God called him out and said, you've got a job to do. I can make use of you. And he gives him faith and love. And we're told later, he gives him eternal life, salvation, life forever. A life that Jesus says starts now is like a life that's more abundant than anything you knew before and then will continue on for eternity, for ages of ages of ages, forever. The, the, the great theologian, pastor of the early church, his name's Augustine, he, he, he was commenting on this passage, and he said, God does not choose anyone who is worthy, but in choosing him, renders him worthy. No one is worthy. None of us are worthy. All of us are sinners. God makes us worthy. When it says, he judged me faithful, if God looked at him and said, okay, he's faithful, I can use him now, at best, it was after God saved him, changed him, made him a new person, and then as he was a believer, said, yep, now I'm putting you into service, and calls him to go be a missionary. At, at best, that's what Paul is saying here. At worst, he's saying, even though I was wicked, he declared me faithful, because he knew what he was going to do with me. He knew he could change me. And the Apostle Paul sets himself here as an example of salvation. We see that in this next section. So I'll read that, 15 and 16. We've seen Jesus' grace to Paul, and now we're going to see Jesus' salvation. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This is the first of a few of these trustworthy statements that Paul is going to talk about here in, in the book of First Timothy, and then he also uses this phrase in Second Timothy and Titus. Basically what he's saying is these, these are probably little like creeds, little like figures of speech, little statements of faith that the people were, would have been familiar with. And he's saying... This one, this is a good one. And, and everyone should believe it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I think this is, this is clearly what's taught throughout the Bible. I mean, we've, we've, refu uh, we've reviewed it quite a bit, but there's at least a few passages that, that this could be like, kind of like a paraphrase quote of. We see in, in Matthew, if you remember when we started Matthew out at the beginning, when the angel appeared to Joseph to tell him to go ahead and marry Mary, because she was going to have this baby. She was pregnant with a baby. And he says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, which literally means savior or salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Jesus himself tells us later on in his ministry in Luke chapter 19, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then when people were wondering in Matthew's gospel again, why is Jesus hanging out with all these like, wicked people? Like, why is he with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and all of the people that good society stays away from? Jesus says, it's, it's not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those that are sick. And then Paul tells us a little while later in Romans chapter 5, he says like, God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this statement is a paraphrase of what the church knew to be true and what Paul is declaring. Everybody, everyone agrees with this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This Messiah, this King who was promised by God for ages and ages past has now come into the world and he didn't come to defeat his enemies, to just kill them all. He could have done that. He came to die, to save sinners. And as we saw this morning, Ariel was going through this as we're walking through these teaching sections. 
Jesus came as a redeemer. He didn't come, again, as a victorious king the first time. He came as a redeemer, one who would offer himself as an as a exchange for sin. He came as a servant to provide salvation. He came to, to die so that he would take the penalty for the sins and be able to offer his life as a ransom for many, to pay, to make other people right, so that then his grace could overflow like it did here with Paul. That's what Jesus came into the world to do. And, and notice just a little, that little phrase, he, he, he came, it, it assumes that he like came from somewhere, he came into the world. This is just another illusion, like an assumption of Paul, that Jesus pre-existed, that Jesus was somewhere else before he came into this world, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He really is God himself who has come in. And if you notice, I won't get into it in a lot of detail, but sometimes it's funny in this little passage, as we saw before, he, he takes God and he takes Christ Jesus and he like basically says they're doing the same thing. And then in this little paragraph right here, it seems like he's praising God especially we'll see in chapter 7. He seems like he's saying things about God, but then it seems like he's talking about Jesus. At this point, Paul doesn't even care to differentiate. He says, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, he came into the world, he is God, and he came for the purpose of saving sinners. That is a trustworthy saying. Everyone needs to agree with it. It is the clearest thing in the Bible. That's why Jesus came, and that's what we should be teaching from the Bible. None of the other genealogy stuff, none of the weird law stuff, none of the myths, the Jesus stuff. That's, that's what we should be teaching. That's why Jesus came. And some people might say, okay, well, after that, Paul says, of whom I am the foremost. What does he mean by that? Some people really kind of play on this present tense, like I currently am the foremost versus I, I was the foremost. And then he repeats it, in case we missed it. He says a little while later, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me the foremost, that means in me the worst, in me the baddest of bad people, the worst sinner. Again, people kind of debate this. Is this just Paul's humility and him understanding? Uh, even after being saved, like the, the depth of depravity in his heart? I think that's part of it. The Bible it makes it very clear that once we're saved, we're not sinless. We're still in like a war with the sin that's within us. The things that we want to do, we don't always do, and the evil that we don't want to do, we just keep on doing. That's true. And we need grace to fight that. But I think what, what Paul is saying here is, I was, again, the, the least likely candidate for this. Like I would have been laughed out of the interview. When I showed up, or when he saved me, Nobody believed it. Ananias didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Everyone else was afraid to talk to me after it happened because they thought I still might be like some sort of undercover spy trying to get them all killed. I was, of anyone who would be saved, the least likely candidate. I was the greatest opponent to what Christ was doing in the world, and he still saved me. I was the worst of sinners. And I don't think, I don't, this is the other side of it, that, um, a little kind of tangent, is that a lot of people think that like the gospel of Jesus Christ is this thing that kind of like makes us nicer people and then it like fixes us because it gives us like high self-esteem, right? Like we'll feel better about ourselves as Christians because we'll, we'll like, we'll, we'll realize how great we are because God loves us or something. And, and there's a little bit of truth to that, but I don't think Paul would argue that at all. The fact that he can still say, I am the greatest of sinners, He's still associated in some way. Like he knew the old man was dead and the new man was created and he was different and changed. But he also still remembered constantly where God brought him from and where he would be if not for Jesus. And I think that level of humility is what the gospel produces and what it's intended to produce. It's not supposed to create a bunch of people with, with high self-esteem. We should all be saying, I was, oh, if it weren't for Jesus, where would I be? I'm not awesome. I'm not great. He didn't, he didn't need me on his team. He didn't need me in his family. Only the goodness of God, only the grace of Jesus that overflows, that superabounds to us is what got me here and what's keeping me here. And we see this throughout Paul's ministry. 
He says, I am the very least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Even when Paul was one of the most successful missionaries the world's ever known, he wasn't tooting his own horn. He said it was only by grace. I'm the least. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. And then he says in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, to me, though I am the very least of the saints. So now he's not only less than all the like leaders and missionaries, now he's like less than every other Christian in his own mind. I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And this is what the gospel does. The gospel humbles us. He always remembered where he came from, and I think we, we have to. We can't forget that. Part of the Christian life is to remember where we came from and to constantly praise God for where he's brought us and where he's taking us. And then notice the other thing in verse 16. He says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might, be display, might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul is saying here in this story that I am an example. I, in my story, in what God did for me, am an example to anyone else who wants to believe, to show you how the gospel works, that God takes his enemies and makes them his friends, that God takes those who are unworthy, just so that everyone can see that there isn't anyone who's beyond the grace of God. There's no one in your life that you can look at and say, well, God wouldn't save them, so I'm not going to waste my time. Or, well, they've heard the gospel, they, they, they know the message, and they're just not listening, so they're done. There's, there's no way we can even look at other people and think that we're better, because, because by Paul being saved and being able to say he's the least, like, who am I? to look down on somebody else or to, to write them off. But if you're not a Christian here, you might actually think, this isn't, this isn't for me. It's not possible for me to be saved. You, you don't know what I've done. You don't, you don't know what my life is like. You don't know the kind of burdens and the sins that I carry around. You might think that, but Paul doesn't think that. Because he knows where he came from. And the gospel, the grace of Jesus was enough to make him new. And if you don't know Jesus, or if you've, you've been keeping that in the back of your head, that I, I can't be used by him. I can't be put into his service. Like, in fact, I don't think I can even believe this stuff. I wish I could believe it, but I'm just not. I'm not good enough for that. Paul says, I was saved so that I could be an example to you. No one's too sinful. Grace abounds to the worst of sinners, to the chief of sinners. Grace can overflow to the worst, most disgusting, heinous, nasty, violent, ignorant, unbelieving people. If I can be saved, anyone can be saved. I think this is Paul's point too. If I can be saved, these people that are teaching all this nonsense at the church and like causing all of these problems, they can be saved too. Like they, they shouldn't be teaching those things. But there's grace for them. So be careful how you handle that situation. No one is too sinful. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And so what does this gospel do? Well, we saw at the very beginning that Paul was thankful. He was full of gratitude. And that, that Jesus had empowered him and equipped him to be put into his service to serve. And here we see that Paul, like almost spontaneously, as he's thinking about what Jesus did and as he's telling it, just out of nowhere, in the middle of a letter, just breaks out into praise. Look at verse 17. He says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. 
to him, to this Jesus, this great God that saved me, the king of ages, the king of the old age, the king who existed before time began, through whom all things were made, who will reign, who is reigning now, and who will reign for the rest of eternity, to him, that great king, the one who's immortal. He, he, he died, and then he rose again, never to see corruption. His body will never decay. He's not like this anymore. He's, he's eternal. He is new. He, he's a picture of what we could be like, but, but God has never died. The eternal God exists, and upon him all things have their being. He existed before time began, and because of him, because of his immortality, because of his eternity, he, he is the very essence of of existence, who holds up the entire universe. And we're told that, 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 that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, actually holds up all of creation just by the word of his power. He is immortal. Then he says he is invisible. This God is so great that he's like beyond the capacity of even any of his creatures to even look at him, to even see him. The only thing that we can see when we see God is the way that he reveals himself to us. He, he like condescends to our level to show us something about himself that makes himself knowable. Not because he is knowable, but because he wants to be known in some way. And so even Jesus, when, when, Jesus, when God comes down into Jesus, we're told that he's like the image of the invisible God. He's the one that God put there so that we could see something of who this God was and what he's like and how we can know him. So we've seen appearances of God. We've seen Jesus, the man, the redeemer. We've seen bushes burning. We've seen fire. We've seen smoke. We've seen God work, but no one's actually seen God. He is beyond our comprehension, beyond the, invisible, the, the, the ability of us to see. And notice he says he's the only God. There is no other God. There's no one else. That, it's not like there's like a God, and then there's like Satan, and they're kind of the yin and yang powers at, at, at at odds with one another, holding each other in eternal balance. It, it's not even like there are like a bunch of other gods and other parts of the universe that own their own little kingdom. Like, no, he, he is the great, eternal, all-powerful, only God. Every other God is either one that he created or it's fake. He is the only God. And to him, to Jesus, be all honor and glory forever and ever. All praise because of the thing. Not only is he all of these things that we were just told, great, powerful, immortal, king, invisible, but he's gracious. He's huge and beyond comprehension. And yet, like, somehow he comes down and he overflows in his grace through Jesus to us. Only he is worthy of all glory, all honor, all of our praise, all of our faithful service forever and ever. And then he says, amen. Amen. Right? And, and, and uh, this is funny too, because, because even though he's writing a letter, <laughs> the word amen is always used because you want someone to agree with you, right? Like it's kind of like a question statement, like agree, right? Like, so if I say amen, you're supposed to say it back. Amen. amen. Like God is, here, I'll, let's try this. Let's try this. It says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He is worth it. He is worthy. He is glorious. And Paul, even in his letter, thinks someone should give him some affirmation that that's, that's true. So we've seen a couple stories here. People's lives. Augustine was a man who was a sinner. He knew that God takes someone who's not worthy and makes them worthy. All the apostles. Even Paul. And I guess as, as I get ready to close, I'm not ready to close yet, but as I get closer to it, I want to read the story of another person who was not worthy. As you guys know, the famous John Newton, the author of the book, or the, 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 the many hymns, but the most famous hymn, Amazing Grace. Um, here's a little bit about his story. He's similar to Paul. He was, 17, uh, he, he was born as a kid in 1725. I guess he was born as a baby. Um, and, and he was actually raised, he had, he had a, a godly mother, but she died when he was seven years old. She taught him how to pray, taught him a little bit about the Lord. And then when he was 11, his, his father was a sailor, 
So he immediately went into a life of sailing. He was shipwrecked multiple times. Eventually worked his way up, and he became the captain, actually, of a slave ship, hauling African slaves across the Atlantic in the, the triangle, the slave trade. And at one point in his life, he actually was, uh, somehow became the slave of someone else after that. And he was captured on an island on the coast of Guinea. Or, or he, he was on the coast of Guinea, a slave, ran away, had this crazy life, lost his mom, worked with his father, slave trader, became a slave himself, shipwrecked. And then finally, he, he was able to like, uh, escape and start a fire, and apparently someone who was a friend of his father happened to be out looking for him. They were trying to find him, and they were able to rescue him. Uh, he started a fire on an island and attracted enough people that they were able to get him out on a, line, long, a long boat from the island. And then on his way back, when he's crossing the Atlantic Ocean, not a believer, but knows enough, He's, he's in the middle of a storm, and he's, he's talking to the, and they're doing everything. They've got the pumps going. They're trying to prevent this, this huge storm from destroying their ship and killing them all. And then on March 10th, 1748, when he thinks he's going to die, he says, that 10th of March is a day much to be remembered by me. I have never allowed it to pass unnoticed since the year 1748. For on that day the Lord came from on high and delivered me out of deep waters. Figuratively and literally. Thought he was going to die. And he says, while they were struggling and pumping and trying to figure out how to, how to keep the ship afloat, he said uh, to the captain of the ship, he says, if this will not do, the Lord have mercy on us. And then he said that, that his words actually shocked him. He wasn't a religious man. He didn't believe in God per se, but he said, the Lord have mercy on us. And it stuck with him, and it kind of scared him. It startled him. And then he said, mercy, mercy. What mercy can there be for me? This was the first desire I had breathed for mercy for many years. About six in the evening, the hold was free from water. They were able to get the water out, and then there was some sort of gleam of hope that they might live. He says, I thought I saw the hand of God displayed in our favor, and I began to pray. I could not utter a prayer of faith. I couldn't draw near to a reconciled God and call him Father. He couldn't even say, he couldn't even call God his Father. He didn't, he didn't even know if he could believe. But he said, my prayer for mercy was like the cry of the ravens, which yet the Lord does not disdain to hear. He said, it is certain that I am not what I ought to be many years later. But he said, but blessed be God, I am not what I once was. God has mercifully brought me up out of the deep, miry clay and has set my feet upon the rock, Christ Jesus. He has saved my soul. And now it is my heart's desire to extol and to honor his matchless, free, sovereign, and distinguishing grace because by the grace of God, I am what I am. It is my heart's great joy to ascribe my entire salvation entirely to the grace of God. That's grace. The grace produces salvation, praise, and service. So as I do close now, getting closer, I would invite you, if you don't know Jesus, if, you, if you're like him where you're like, I can't, even, I can't even say like a legitimate prayer. If I can't, I don't know if I believe. At least ask for mercy. Jesus can save you. He really can. And if you trust him as your savior and you submit to him as your Lord, he will save you. And if you are a believer, then I, I again encourage you, you have to, we have to remember where we came from. If we are going to continue to be effective in the service of God, we can't forget what he did for us, where he brought us from. The sins, the things that are, that are back there, we, don't, we, don't, we, we, we can't forget them. We can move on from them. We can grow in Christ-likeness. 
In a sense, we forget what lies behind and we, we move forward. But we still remember. We just don't repeat as much as we can. And so if you, if you are a believer, I ask you, humble yourself. Trust the Lord. And then, as Paul does here, let's praise Him. Let's serve Him. He can enable us. He strengthens us for His service. He empowers us. And we can start practicing that now. He wants more laborers in His harvest. He's inviting you to participate, to tell, to make Him known, to share His grace, His salvation, His praise with those around you. And we can even practice. We're going to close with a song. So let's all sing that together about this amazing grace from the Lord. Because the gospel of grace of Christ Jesus does produce salvation, praise, and service. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you have taken even the worst sinner and saved him. We thank you that you can save us. We thank you that you have saved us. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to worship you, to praise you. Lord, even in a, even as a screech of a raven for those of us that can't sing. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified by our singing today and by our service this week and by our proclamation of Jesus as the great Savior who came into the world to save sinners. Lord, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.